Welcome to Tuma Mina Teaching. This is your third geography lesson for Term 2 out of a series of four lessons. In this lesson, we will be looking at how weather is measured or what tools are used to measure the weather, as well as how the earth is heated. We have looked at weather elements in the previous episodes, but today it's important for us to look at how the weather actually gets to the forecasters. Weather balloons, or radio sonder, record the weather in the atmosphere. They take note of the temperature, the pressure, the humidity, the precipitation, etc. And they send this information to meteorologists who are working in labs. When the weather balloons reach the atmosphere, they tend to burst. Weather maps or synoptic charts are produced every day in order to assist with weather forecasting. The information is obtained from weather stations all around the world and even sometimes from ships and aircraft. In the case of a ship, a cargo ship or a passenger ship can be embarking on a long journey and meteorologists will often take this opportunity to record the weather as the ship travels. Meteorologists will often launch probes off the back of the boat and get readings such as the water temperature, perhaps the humidity, but more than that, ships have actually got a full-on weather station on board the ship. So as the ship moves through specific regions and through specific temperatures, the temperature, the pressure, the precipitation and the humidity can all be read at the same time. And this is really, really useful because often these ships go to places that us as humans can't really get to. So this helps us to get a very accurate idea of the weather around us or around our country or city that we're living in. Information also comes from islands that are in our surrounding seas, so namely Marion Island and Gough Island. These islands are in the Southern Ocean or south of where we are, and in this case, South Africa. All the data is sent to the Central Weather Bureau where it is translated and it is recorded in a way that is easier for the general public to understand. And in some cases, the weather needs to be sent to professionals or to scientists who actually need to analyze what's really going on in the atmosphere around us. What the general public ends up actually seeing is far less complicated than the synoptic charts and the diagrams that are used to obtain the initial data. Another way to record the weather is by a Stevenson screen. Weird name, right? The Stevenson screen is a wooden slatted box that is 121 centimeters above the ground and inside it, it houses thermometers, barometers, and other weather recording instruments. So in actual fact, it kind of functions as a standalone weather station. It is placed so that the door opens on the shady side. And for us in South Africa, that is the south side. The Stevenson screen is placed so high above the ground so that a realistic temperature can be read or measured. In the night, temperatures tend to drop, whereas during the day, they tend to rise. So if the Stevenson screen is 121 centimeters above the ground, this ensures a more realistic temperature. The Stevenson screen also has slatted or louved sides, and this allows wind to pass through. The Stevenson screen is painted white so that it does not absorb the heat, because if it absorbs the heat, then again, an unrealistic temperature is given. For the reasons mentioned, you can see that the design, the color, the materials used, all have a very important function in making this box successful. Many people think that wind is a result of the earth turning on its axis. Now, if this was the case, it would mean that it would be windy 24 seven, every day, 24 hours a day, because the earth is constantly turning or rotating on its axis. All along the Earth, from the equator to the poles, there are different pressure belts, ranging from high pressures to low pressures. So wind is air that is moving from a high pressure to a low pressure in order to try and equalize and balance out the different pressures. Wind also never blows in a straight line. When you look at trees, it might look like the wind is hitting them straight on, but this is actually not the case. Air bends or deflects by a force known as Coriolis force. And the definition of this is 
force exerted on the Earth because of the Earth's rotation. Therefore, air bends or deflects to the left in the southern hemisphere and air rotates clockwise around a low pressure cell and anti-clockwise around a high pressure cell. The same is true for the northern hemisphere. Air is deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and the high and the low pressure cells are opposite to what they were in the southern hemisphere. So in the example of Coriolis force, air is forced away from the high pressure center, almost like children who are on a merry-go-round. If I am on a merry-go-round and you are standing just off the merry-go-round, so you are not moving, and you want me to throw a ball to you. When I throw the ball from the merry-go-round, the ball is not going to move in a straight line. Because the merry-go-round is moving round and round and round, the ball is going to curve or it's going to deflect. The same analogy is true for Coriolis force. Nearer the Earth's surface, the air tends to move slightly more towards a low pressure center, but it doesn't quite ever get to the center. Onto the heating of the Earth. The Earth's atmosphere is heated directly by the Earth and not the sun's rays, although the sun is our main source of energy. The air close to the ground is warmer than the air higher up from the ground. Therefore, it can be said, the higher up you go, the cooler the air temperature gets. Energy comes from the sun and travels in short waves, solar radiation, and we call this insulation, which stands for incoming solar radiation. Only 45% of this heat actually reaches Earth. The Earth then radiates this heat back into the atmosphere in the form of long wave radiation or terrestrial radiation. So, we learn that the Earth is actually heated predominantly by terrestrial radiation or long wave radiation rather than incoming solar radiation. So, if it is cloudy in the morning, the clouds tend to block out the sun and the area remains cool. That is, until the clouds eventually lift. If it is cloudy at night, the clouds absorb the long wave terrestrial radiation and they actually help to warm up the Earth a little. When there are no clouds, it tends to be much colder at night. In fact, if there are no clouds, the long wave terrestrial radiation tends to escape and all of the heat is lost. Think about a cloudless, starry night. It's beautiful. You can see the stars, maybe you can even see the Milky Way, but one thing that you will be guaranteed of is a very cold, chilly night. This is because there is no insulation. Whereas if you had a very cloudy night, although you wouldn't be able to see the stars or the Milky Way, the temperature would be a little warmer as the clouds almost act as a blanket around the Earth, keeping the heat from the day in. Join us next time as we look at our last video for this section, which is factors that affect temperature and rainfall, as well as the climate of South Africa. Thank <laughs> you.